67 of the I Rock Knits podcast. My name is Corey Eichelberger and I'm coming to you from a frigid cold Minnesota. Happy Valentine's Day, happy President's Day. I am recording on Monday, February 15th, 2021. I am glad to have all you of you here with me today. Come on in for a hug. You know, we're not hugging in real life yet, but I'm hopeful <laughs> that in the next couple of months, we will be. We will be able to start venturing out and getting outside of our houses. Um, what am I wearing today? This is our sweater of the day. I decided to put it on because it's so cold. This is my wonderful wallaby. I will be putting a few pictures in as I talk about it briefly for all of you. I have a um, Ravelry information sheet here. So it is worsted weight, 4.5 stitches to one inch, knit on a US six and a US eight. It is adult and children, bottom up, hood in the round, Kitchener long sleeved, positive ease, raglan, ribbed, seamless, unisex, and it is a written pattern. Funny because for so many years, you could not get this pattern without calling or sending a letter to the woman who wrote it. It was published first in January of 1983. And 6,100 some people have projects on Ravelry. Can you imagine having that kind of staying power with a pattern, an individual pattern over the years that so many people just continue to knit over and over again? I have knit five or more of the Wallaby, mostly for children, but this one is one of my long time favorites. I knit this out of just this lovely variegated yarn that's just wonderful. It fits just great. I love the clasps that I added to it to make it a little more um, adult and a little less hoodie like. Um, doesn't have the pulling on the neck and the dropping back without the strings on it. It does have a pocket in the front. There's a a pocket that is picked up along the bottom edge here. That was probably one of the trickier parts of, of doing this sweater. When I knit this sweater in 1996, I think, so one of my oldest that I still wear, I took a class and that's why I think I can remember uh, from Rosemary, my mentor, and we were at the Needle Nest in YZ for any of you who were um, shoppers of that store that moved from Wayzata to Minnetonka um, and kind of back again. Uh, so I have just wonderful memories. But one of the things that you had to do was lay your sweater body, you would knit it from the bottom and knit, lay it out and then take a crochet hook and stick it through a hole and pull some yarn through so that you could pick up stitches along the bottom edge of where that actual pouch was gonna be made. And once you got that started over here, you had to have enough yarn to get over to the other end and just have your tail hanging off. I mean, I just remember it being kind of a, kind of a weird convoluted way to do it, but it left you with the tail in the right place, which was really nice. And then you just knit up back and forth this little pocket, decreasing along the edges with some garter stitch um, to kind of keep it from rolling in and then once you got it up so many rows you just three needle connected that together so the construction of it is just wonderful i mean many people have made it without the pocket but learning that technique early on for kind of an afterthought pocket was really interesting um, I did knit several without the hood for my nieces so if you would want to go to my pattern page I just started knitting the hood and then did some garter stitch so it had a little flip back collar which was really cute I think mostly because I just got tired of knitting hoods when I was knitting it for my two nieces and two nephews um, on one side I have two nieces and one side I have two nephews and in age they go back and forth one kind of one to one and a half years apart so I used to know like if one was 10 one was nine one was eight and one was seven <laughs> it kind of went like that um, so I knit these when they were rather young and they're all now um, growing up and getting married which is just 
amazing to me. I have one more to get married this summer uh, in August, and then those four children. I have a younger niece um, on the other side. But yeah, it's just ironic to think about knitting these that long ago. So I knit mine in a tapestry yarn called Tapestry. I'll never forget it because from Classic Elite, and um, people ask me if I ever wear this out, knitters will often say, where did you get that yarn? I love that yarn. And I've never seen a yarn um, that is just like it anywhere, but it's been discontinued for many, many years. I knit a lot of stuff out of this yarn. I knit mittens, several pairs of mittens and hats <laughs> out of this yarn. So this is taking me down memory, <laughs> memory lane a bit. I would highly recommend it. If you're looking for a sweatshirt, um, the raglan shaping is really well done. Uh, the original um, design came in a little folded booklet, so it was like this, and then you opened it up and it had pages and pages of instructions. There were finished sweater measurements allowing for two inches of ease in size 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 um, for kids, and then petite or chest size 34, 36, 40, 44, 48, and 52 for adults and uh, they were all named W words at the time. So you had Wanda, Willie, Wilhelmina, Warren, Washington, Wayland, Wilma, Winifred, Waverly, Wilbur, Wyatt, and Wisconsin for all of the different sizing names. Isn't that cute? So clever. Yeah, it's just, it was really, it was introduction, 1984, uh, question, unquestionably a trademark design, reprinted 27 times, 3,000 each time. I retired it in, in 2018 when I introduced an updated version. The original Wallaby includes sizes for the entire family, 12 in all. Credit must be given to Elizabeth Zimmerman uh, and her quest for seamless patterns, so many of her techniques have been poured into this design. The Wallaby utilizes a circular and double-pointed needles, and the only seaming is to use to Kitchener the to underarm opening and to fuse the top of the hood. One of my favorite stories about this sweater happened when it was judged at a national convention. Initially disappointed when I saw that it had received a second place ribbon, I read the comment card. It stated, this sweater received a second place because there were no seams to judge. <laughs> I chose to take it as a compliment. Isn't that great? It's on the pattern page. When I read it this morning, I was like, oh, I'm gonna share that with everybody. Over the years, I've been astounded by knitters who report how many wallabies they've knitted and the heartwarming stories of the compliments they receive. Carol Anderson. Oh, so we are we are at the W's in the pattern sweater pattern list for the class, which means there's only one left. I have a Z uh, that I will probably do next time, kind of depending. And then I have made a list of sweaters that I don't share in the teaching sweaters class. So. Um, 50 Shades of Sweaters, Bellies, Boobs, and Butts <laughs> is the name of that class. And I have 50 to 60 sweaters that I share in that class. So we've gone through A to Z and I've kind of refined it, moved it, you know, moved some things out and other things in over the years. So I have a stack of sweaters that are not included in the class anymore. Not because they're not good sweaters, but they don't have a specific thing to teach, right? So each sweater had its own Thing that I would try to teach on whether or not it be fit or seams or whatever and then I tried to have a broad range of different styles so when people go to try them on they would be able to kind of try a yoked versus a raglan and that kind of thing so I think I made a list of about 10 or 12 sweaters that can be now included after that so they'll start stop kind of being alphabetical not that many of you probably even knew that they were alphabetical but that's how I do them in class alphabetically so it's just easier to go through and uh, and I have added it dif dropped in different patterns as I've completed patterns along the way so it does get interrupted a bit I think I have about 12 or 15 shawls left to do so I don't know how I got off in my tracking because the shawl class, 50 Shades of Shawls, also is alphabetical, and I usually also take 50 to 60 of those. Anyway, so someone had asked where we were headed with all this when I run out of things to talk about. It's never going to happen, right? <laughs> this is your Cory time. <laughs> 
when I sit down and open my mouth, all the things just flow out freely. So I should be able to keep this up for at least another year with doing sweaters that I, you know, have in a stack or have just listed. Then you all know I have five or six sweaters that are on the needles and not completed. So maybe in the next six to eight months, I can complete some of those and also add them to this show going forward. The first set that is in the, I finished this section, you know, finished objects, whatever you wanna call it, is this one. When I first got my thumbs back and I could start knitting, uh, the littlest needles were bothering my hands. Doing tiny little micro movements were bothering my hands, still are a bit. So I started doing some things on bulky, chunky needles, 10 and a half, 11s, because I could just hold them a little looser and I didn't have that fine little motion. And so I finished a couple of chunky cowls and I got them done and I thought, oh, I'm gonna put these away in the bench. And then I thought, oh, I should just share them because although super easy to knit, I just think they turned out really fun. The first one is the super, the first one is called the Super Simple Bulky Brioche Crossover by Natalia Elam. And it is a free pattern on Ravelry. Uh, 26 people have made it. And really all I wanted was a cast on number. I wanted to do some brioche again um, in one color. I like to keep practicing to keep my skills up for brioche in one color and two color. So I just wanted a cast on number and I was kind of out looking around just trying to you know, find something for it to make a cowl in brioche just like this. And I saw this one and I thought, oh, I have buttons. You know, you guys know how much I love buttons. So I thought I'm gonna give this one a try. So it is free, it's available out on Ravelry. And it was super simple to knit. You just cast on, do your brioche stitch, back and forth, back and forth until it's long enough to cross over. I literally used one skein of Madeline Tosh ASAP yarn which is considered a super bulky. It had 90 yards and I got this done, which was really hard to believe. I kind of thought that I would need more yarn. I had two skeins when I started, but I didn't. So um, it was easy to knit and then I just had these lovely buttons. So I hope you could see those up close. And then I knit the little perky hat to match it. I thought that this looked close enough to the brioche stitches to kind of coordinate and I have this hat practically memorized. You guys know I've made a couple of these. It isn't a super tall hat so I do do quite a bit of plain stockinette here before I start the decreases in order to make it a little taller but I did get this out of one skein and had a small ball left over but not enough to make a pom-pom. Uh, I really I like this hat. It's super easy done in the bulky yarn and I think it coordinates really well. And you guys know how much I love orange. Uh, this is a pretty orange, it's very tonal, and in the winter time, I think it's fun to wear bright colors. So I thought, I'm just gonna share these two today. Then this one is actually the Monster Cowl, and that was by Julia Allen, and it talked about the Monster Cowl before, but I decided to do a coordinating hat. So this is Kirby Werby yarns in the cooler than a box of peppermints colorway, which I just love. So when I knit the cowl, I just knit it back and forth and you just re you do two repeats. One here, a center double decrease, one here. So when I got done, I thought if I could make a coordinating hat, keeping the color striping in the hat, how am I gonna do that? How am I gonna keep the striping looking like this? Because if I just start knitting in the round, the number of stitches in the circumference is not going to be the same as this number. So here's my plan. I folded the cowl in half. I just folded it in half. So I knit the same cowl until it was the circumference of my head. I have that folded over, but you know what I mean. So I just knit it until I got the circumference of my head. And then when I folded in half, I had additionally cast on three extra stitches along the edge right here for garter. So at the very bottom of the hat, you see that I have these three garter stitches. So when I folded it over, I just whip stitched it together. I just folded it and just whip stitched and left that those three little stitches hanging out. Then I've got this round tube 
connected and I had Kitchenered it together just like I did on the cowl. Then I picked up and that top edge, which is the fold, so you have this really nice folded center double decrease right there. And I picked up around and then I knit up and started the decreases and went to the top. So it ended up looking a lot like this one, decreases and then to the top in the same weight of yarn. I did have to rip back and add a little more height. I didn't get quite enough height on the first time around and I was working with leftovers from two skeins of yarn. So the, the color repeat didn't quite work out exactly the same, but it's fairly close, right? You can see the pink and the red with the black. So I, <laughs> I think it turned out really fun. This is double thickness then. So for our colder climates, it would be kind of fun. So Cherie con commented on my Instagram post that I posted of this hat and cowl that she, <laughs> she thought it was fun and she would need to do the hat. She doesn't feel like she should share the pattern numbers and things because it is a pattern for sale, right? The monster cowl. But if you own the monster cowl and you need her cast on numbers or you can't figure it out from the pictures, then just contact her and she'll give you those numbers. So I'm not gonna share that. I didn't share the cast on numbers for the cowl either. I owned the monster cowl pattern, so I could go look it up and I could see what two repeats were of the chart. Um, just seems fair, right? That you wouldn't share someone's cowl pattern instructions free, for free when she actually has it for sale. So I just wanna be clear about that. I have a recipe of the week for you this week. This is chicken tortilla soup recipe from the Stitch It podcast way back in the day. And uh, we made it yesterday. It was just wonderful on a cold, snowy winter day. You have a can of kidney beans, can of black beans, and a can of whole kernel corn, and one can of fire roasted tomatoes with green chilies. One box of chicken broth, six ounces of enchilada sauce, mild or spicy, but about a third of a can four frozen chicken breasts, one tablespoon garlic, chopped onions if you'd like, and cumin. This is meant to be made in a crock pot. You put the first 10 ingredients into the slow cooker in the morning, set it for eight hours, take the chicken breasts out, shred them, put them back in, and serve it with a dab of sour cream, some cheese, and some crushed tortilla chips. It freezes well, it makes a ton, and tastes even better the second day. Those are the notes. We made it on the stove top because we didn't have chicken. So Ross had to run to the store yesterday and um, I just thought there was chicken in the freezer and we had gotten all the other ingredients out to double check things. I haven't been doing the grocery shopping and so we, are, we run out of things occasionally because I would just automatically buy a chicken, a beef and a pork every time I went to the grocery store pretty much. We always had lots of extras because that's the way I like to keep the freezer stocked. Anyway, Ross went, ran to the grocery store. He had to drop something off anyway and picked up the chicken breast. So we made it in this, um, on the stove top yesterday afternoon. Started at about three o'clock, I think. So I just cooked the chicken breasts in the chicken broth and added the onions in, um, sauteed them first. And then I just cooked that down for a lot longer than it needed to be, but it was just easy to have it on low on the stove. And then I added in all the ingredients at the end while Ross shredded the chicken. Um, I did not have enchilada sauce in the pantry and I thought I had some extra. I always keep the extra can of it frozen in the freezer and what was in the freezer was tomato sauce and not enchilada sauce when I had looked earlier. You know, <laughs> one of those moments. So I just put uh, half a cup, a third of a can worth of taco salsa, you know, just salsa in there to kind of do that and then that tomato sauce that was frozen in the freezer to kind of make my own enchilada sauce flavor. I was thinking that this recipe had a package of chicken gravy in it. One of those packages you buy in the grocery store that just adds a lot of flavor and, um, or you can make your own. You can just Google that and make your own, but um, out of different spices. I added it because I thought it was supposed to be in there and it's not actually on the list now that I read it and it was still delicious, <laughs> still delicious. I ended up putting in another container of chicken broth. I had leftovers in the freezer and I just wanted to use it up and I thought the soup was really um, condensed <laughs> with all the vegetables and meat in it. So I just wanted to make it go a little further. So I added that. Now when we make soup, we make a big pot. 
we usually freeze half and then we eat it twice. So we won't eat it tonight, but we'll eat it tomorrow night when it will be even better. So just a really hearty, easy, I, you know, another dump recipe from Corey. Just dump it all in and you're done. So if you love crock pot stuff, I would highly recommend that one for sure. It's just easy to do. And I have a little tip in the recipe section this week. Do any of you follow Nance Whistle on Instagram? If you don't and you like being on Instagram a lot, you probably should go over and follow her. She was the Great British Bake Off winner four seasons ago, I think, roughly. And she cooks and has a new has a cookbook out um, that she self-published because she couldn't get... She's 70-something years old, and she did not feel like she had technology experience to do... Uh, online presence at the time and if so if you go back into her earlier Instagram feed she was really learning how to use the camera and how to show how she cooks things and she's just amazing she's got a new book coming out on using natural ingredients to clean and it's a whole tips and trip book I think it's coming out in maybe April but I have her cookbook sizzle and drizzle and she is so fun to watch. Every single day she posts something. I think she posted daily for four years, three or four, um, never taking a break until finally her husband said, you've got it down now, you, you could take a, a break from posting all the time. But she's always making something that just smells wonderful and is really good. But she bakes a lot, obviously. And this is one of her tips that I used this past week and it was brilliant. This is, the cereal liner bag from a box of cereal. Little did I know that you can take the cereal bag out, dump it out, just pull apart the seams, and it becomes a piece of cellophane. Amazing. And she uses it to roll out sticky dough. So she'll put one down on her countertop and lay her dough in the middle and then use your rolling pin and she'll put the other one up on top. And I don't bake all that often. Hi, bud. Someone got up from under the table, bumped the camera, and had to shake. So now he's going back under. Can you lay down? Okay. I don't bake all that often where I'm rolling out you dough. You bake bread and rolls and things without having to roll something out. But this was so slick. We had two loaves of pizza dough in the freezer because we per can purchase pizza dough looks like bread dough in the freezer thing and it's just really quick and slick for making like breadsticks or something at the last minute if you just take it out you can let it raise and then cut it and roll it but this week we decided to use the two um, frozen loaves that were in the freezer to make calzones because they'd been in there for a while and I was like we really need to use those up next time I'll just make pizza dough but let's use those so I took them out and put them in a sprayed loaf pan and let them rise. And then, you know, they, once they got above the height of the pan, I just plopped them onto the cellophane and put one on top and just rolled out two big pieces of pizza dough like this. And then I cut them in half and then we just lay them on a cookie sheet. I use stoneware and put all my calzone toppings on one side, lifted up the rectangle and folded it toward the other side and then pinched with a fork. So I love making calzones this way because Ross can have all the extra meat he wants and I can just put all the vegetables in mine. So I put um, peppers and onions that I had sauteed earlier and mushrooms and spinach in mine and I use raw spinach and I just pack it in there because it disintegrates down into nothing. And then Ross made hamburger. Um, he cooked sausage and pepperoni and a little cheese and pizza sauce on it and it, it was delicious. But the cleanup, the rolling pin wasn't dirty, the counter wasn't dirty. I, it was, and all I did was wipe these off with soap and water. And then I just rolled them back up and put them in the back of my um, drawer by my rolling pin. It was beautiful. What a brilliant idea. So she's really big on single use plastics, like trying to get us to, you know, not be so wasteful. And so this is one of the ideas that she had for not using um, 
cling wrap. This could be used for a lot, all kinds of projects. If you had, if you have little kids and you taped two of these on the kitchen counter together and put stuff on the inside, you could make one of those mats that have like oil in them or whatever, and you put glitter and stars and the little kids can mush it around and move it and make pictures. Do you know what I'm talking about? Check out Pinterest, but you know, that would use this up, but it would be an easy way to make anything that you need cellophane for. These are, they're really durable and hardy and we eat, Ross eats a lot of cereal. I don't eat much cereal, but anyway, I just thought I'm gonna leave that out on the dining room table and share that with all of you this week. So I don't usually do tips or tricks in the recipe, but there you go. So let's get right into knitting tips and <laughs> tips and tricks. I have a really fun thing to share with you this week. Several months ago, I was talking to Amber on the phone. We were FaceTiming, which we do once a week, probably, um, when we both have time. And, you know, we'll talk for quite a while. But I was organizing, looking for buttons. And I started sorting on the bed because I keep my button jars in my stand-up dresser that has a front center opening and these are my button jars so these I got at Joanne fabrics this is one button jar I have one that's a bit taller which I like a little bit better it holds a little bit more and then this one is happens to be glass because I needed one more and this one has a glass lid so I started sorting buttons on the top of the bedspread while we were talking I, I went in to search for buttons and I thought I could just put my hands on something and the next thing I knew we had spent two hours talking and I had sorted all my buttons and Amber said let me see how you're doing that and I said oh I've done this for years so if I have a set of buttons that all go together I tie them together with a string or with dental floss so I just take a needle and stick it through and tie a little bunch together. This one actually happens to have yarn to hold it together, but that's all the buttons that are alike. And so then I was sorting them into, this happens to be the pink and red bag that I, and I eventually went and got little baggies to put them in because I had sorted them all. So here's my pink bag. Here's my yellow button bag. Then I have a purple button bag, which doesn't have very many in it. Then I did little tiny white shirt buttons separately. I did brown buttons, big and small, wood and leather in one bag. And I have black and gray tiny little buttons in one bag. These are themed buttons. So this has got fruit in it. It has a flowers. It has uh, buttons that I used on another sweater I see in here now. So that's kind of fun to see that in there. And they're all tied together. So. I was showing Amber and she goes, that's a good podcast tip. And I was like, you're right, it is a good pod podcast tip. So what I did is I just dumped all of the bags into other bags and got them sorted. So here's all red and then these are already all tied together. So I sat with her that day and spread everything out and I could lift out all the things that were already tied together. And then I just double checked that anything that was red didn't match and boy, was that a great job to get done. Now I go in to look for a button. I went the other day to look for a pink button for my niece's Valentine hat. And I, cause I thought I had a pink button and boy, I pulled that out within a few seconds. It was just super slick. It, and it's fun to look at these to see how many I have. Cause then I can go one, two, three, four, five. Oh, I have six of those and it, I don't have to search through the whole thing to figure it out. These are some of my favorites. I'm gonna show you these. I want to knit a sweater that I can use these on. Look at that, it's a girl. <laughs> and I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them all tied together on a little green string. <laughs> I love that button. I'm gonna knit a sweater just to use on that button. Now, occasionally I'll have a card but boy, these took up way too much room in the jar, right? And so I probably took a lot, cut a lot of them off the card and just strung them up to have them be in their own little string so that I didn't have to keep so many of them on cards. I have a few on cards I'm seeing in here. 
But yeah, it really made for a much better way for me to store. So if you could find yourself a giant jar, and this would be a good kid project too. Like if you wanted kids, some a kid to sort all your buttons, be a good sorting project for you know elementary school. Um, little ones to sort the things that are the same or alike. Anyway, I'm putting them all the way. That's how I roll. Gotta have everything in this right place. So, tie your buttons together with dental floss or yarn or string. Didn't take long at all to kind of sort them all. I mean, I have a lot. And I know many of you have button collections, boxes of buttons, um, buttons from grandmothers and great grandmothers. So it's just really a way to kind of keep them all together and be able to use them then. Because if you really need five and you only have four and you're, you're searching through three, you know, bins of to find one, it's just a lot of waste of time. So that's how I found these the other day. Just went in there and I was like, they're orange and yellow. I know right where to work, where to look. So it worked really well for me. You guys know I love a good Instagram ad product. <laughs> Did any of you see this yarn pig <laughs> on Instagram? I had to buy it. This is the pig's tail and this is the pig's mouth. And it had, this is a screw. Do you know what it's for? You put it on a bowl so you can tighten it down. You can put your yarn ball in there and run it through there and it turns any bowl into a yarn bowl. But it's a knitting pig. I just thought it was so clever. It, I'm sure it's handmade like an egg and then this you have to have these parts with this on it. I had to have it. It's a little pricey. I, I don't think everyone needs one. You don't have to go out and buy it. There is, you know, I do not believe in keeping up with the knitters. But I'm gonna put this on my little table in a, in a fun colored bowl. I'm gonna get down an orange ceramic or red ceramic bowl I have Fiesta wear. So I thought I would get down one that I don't use very often and stick it on there. So here it is on a bunch of different, well, I'll put that on the screen. Removable, non-destructive, portable, light and durable, match bowl or container size to suit any yarn, sorry, to suit yarn ball size, easy flow, stainless steel yarn guide, nylon clamping screw. It's called Pig. You can get it at Koigu for $28. I'll just put it out there. And you have your choice of light or dark wood. I'm a light wood gal. So, little pig with a tail. I have a big S on my forehead for, right? I just love a good gadget. And honest, we're not going anywhere these days. I'm not spending any money. I have more money in my PayPal account right now than I've ever had. This kind of burns a hole in my pocket. I think, oh. I have money in there. It's the first time ever in four years of designing that I've had money in my PayPal account. So oh, I'm always buying yarn for new ideas and samples and things. So knitting pig, there you go. I was asked if, if by someone, I get a lot of emails from people asking for help with things. And you know, it gets really hard to do pattern support all the time for people. Um, if you have a question about a pattern, it, it is very appropriate to go ahead and ask the designer of the pattern for help if you're struggling. It depends on how many times you're asking, but if you're asking a designer for help on a pattern that they didn't write, that gets to be really hard. And I have friends <clears throat> who repeatedly have said to me that I'm too nice and I will answer and answer and answer, which I did with a woman this weekend who was a new brand new knitter and she needed all the help and I didn't teach her how to knit she's just a person out in the world I don't know who she is but she had multiple questions but I was exhausted by the time <laughs> by the time I was done trying to help her and I would go and look up some YouTube videos and send them to her and then she said but what if this happens and I spent way too much time 
So then the next person that asked me, I tried to say no. I was like really kind and I said, you know, I provide yarn support on patterns that I've written, but it's really hard for me to do it on patterns that I haven't written. And then I felt bad for two days. <laughs> I just have to fess up that I can't, I, I want to help and I like helping and it makes me feel good to help and I usually have answers. And so I will, to my dying death, try to help you <laughs> figure something out. It's, it isn't a character flaw to want to help people, right? It can exhaust me. It can take a lot of my time and energy, but right now I have the time and energy and I'm a big girl. If I really didn't want, I could say no. So anyway, this is not at all related to this person's question that happened long before this. But they wanted to know if I had a formula for using of a different weight when they wanted to knit a sweater pattern. And I responded and said, the first thing you can answer is no, right? Like if you just wanna swap out worsted for sport, it ain't gonna work. Worsted for DK, it ain't gonna work. No matter what, you're going to have to do some calculations if you wanna swap yarn. If you can get gauge, then it'll work with a different kind of yarn. But if you can't get gauged, then you have to do all the maths. And so I was trying to tell this person to be helpful that it's really hard to do, but it can be done. And Elizabeth Zimmerman's book, Knitting Without Tears, with the formula for how to fit your own body and how to get the numbers and the percentages of all the things is the, the best resource. But that's a lot of reading and a lot of figuring. And some people aren't there yet in their knitting journey. But I did find a resource online by Ann Budd that I want to share with all of you because I have not seen this before. I will put a link to it in the show notes down below, always in the drop box. Things don't link well for me there. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And I'm not really willing to spend a lot more time at trying to figure it out. Right? There are just some things. So they're always in the Ravelry group or you can just email me. How to Adapt a Pattern Written for One Gauge to Another Gauge by Ann Bug from a talk on the mathematics of knitting for the Front Range Knitting Guild, originally posted at 2010. It has the, the link to it. And it is literally a four step situation here. I was asked how to adapt a pattern written for one gauge, gauge to another gauge. For example, let's say that a pattern calls for worsted weight at a gauge of five stitches to the inch, and you want to adapt it for sport weight at a gauge of 6.5 stitches to the inch. Let's say that pattern calls for casting on 98 stitches. How many stitches would you cast on to produce a piece the same width at your tighter gauge? So it's the number of stitches over the pattern. It's, it's a whole formula, but it's math, right? And I know how to do this in my head, and I've gone over it on this podcast before. We've talked about number of stitches going into a 40-inch round body circumference. But this is a, would be a nice formula sheet to have um, as a resource for yourself. And so I, I shared this with this person. I was so excited that I found it, right? Like sometimes in answering people's questions, it really helps me. <laughs> Like I go down a rabbit hole on YouTube and I'm like, oh, there's a video for this. There's a stitch pattern I can use, right? That kind of thing. So sometimes I like researching and looking up things and finding things. So this was super helpful to me. I don't even remember who asked me. It was a while ago. And but she'll know and she'll probably feel bad that she asked me. But honestly, no, this was a great resource to find. <laughs> really good resource. And I didn't do the work of this. Like this is not me. I didn't make this up. And it's very well done. So I will link it in the show notes. All that to say, whoo, Corey, going on and on again. Today, when this video goes live, another tutorial will go live. When I teach my beginning knitters at the library, instead of having them use double pointed needles to close the top of their hat in the Aaron beginning, basic beginning Aaron weight hat pattern, I have them use two circular needles. Because we have circulars in the class, no one has to buy anything else. I just bring a few extras and we can get to the top of the hat and just put it on two circulars and close it. And many times over the years, I have had knitters ask me to please put that information in a video on YouTube and I haven't done it. And it has been in my phone on my list of things to do. 
I do not have a great video tutorial setup in my home yet where I have an overhead camera. So I have to turn this to make it flat and then I have to look through the top of it. And it's just not the best, like I'm not doing the best video tutorials, but I would like to get better at it. And I am thinking about investing in a different kind of stand to hold my overhead because um, I'm speaking to a Knitters Guild here in two weeks and I'm gonna have to show some stuff. So anyway, we've been looking. This video is not the best tutorial you would ever have on closing the top of a hat. The reason I'm telling you is that when I put a new tutorial up on YouTube, you all will get a notification, right? It will come up as a, because I did this last time and so many of you went over and watched my um, how to knit with the mini skein around your neck tutorial. I have so many requests for that. What podcast did you talk about knitting with the mini skeins from around your neck? And every time I had to go back and look up which podcast it was, by the way, all the tips and tricks from every podcast are listed in a separate thread in my Ravelry group. And so I always add the tips and tricks there, but I have to go back. I think it was episode 10 at like minute 43, 43. I have it down now. And I thought, you're right, I need to put that mini skein video together separately. And a lot of you watched it. And you didn't need to watch it. Some of you thought it was a new podcast, an additional new podcast. And it wasn't. It was just like a four minute video on how to knit. I'm just giving you a heads up that that's going to happen again. I have it scheduled to go out tomorrow, tonight at midnight when this video goes live so they'll both happen at the same time so the notifications will come together and you do not have to watch it it's for the library knitters for future reference and for the ones who want to knit another hat and can't remember quite how to close the top so i just wanted to have it as a note to tell everyone all right let's talk about my new pattern coming out tomorrow if you are subscribed to my newsletter, you will have gotten a newsletter form from me that you have a coupon code that you can use for my new design. And this is the lover of dogs <laughs> pattern that I've been talking about that some of you thought I was going to do a dog sweater, but I did not. So this is the set. Looks like this. And on, it's a cowl and hat, and on the cowl it says, pet the dog, feed the dog, walk the dog. Pet the dog, feed the dog, walk the dog. And it has a little heart and a little paw print and a little bone. And it's the same on the hat. So feed, walk, and pet. I just think it's hilarious. Because if you have a dog, you totally get it. That's all you do most days. Feed, walk, pet. Feed, walk, pet. Some of you have dogs that don't need petting all the time. Mine is not one of them. He wants to be petted continually. If he's near me, he's happy, but he's more happy if I'm petting him. And so I just thought that this would be kind of a funny way. I also knit it up in a bigger hat in a slouchy version. So if you are the per kind of person that likes to wear, you know, a slouchy hat on the back of your head, it is written in the pattern for that. This is the first one I knit. I kind of thought I would do dog colors, right? Like brown and golds, kind of those kind of colors. And I did the Corey's two color cast on and the corrugated ribbing. The interesting different thing about this pattern is that I included a twisted stitch in the ribbing. Um, I will try to show it close up, but can you see how there's a little tiny cable in the blue ribbing? And what we figured out kind of going down the line after I, I had knit all of these that that little twisted stitch in the ribbing shows up better in the lighter color so if you are doing a um your own and you just switch the corrugated ribbing to do that twisted stitch in the lighter color that you're using it shows up a little better it does show up um barely but it it is it's hard to see on the camera but i can see it plain as day in real life it's just like a cabled corrugated ribbing and I thought that would be something kind of fun to try for people. It is not an actual cable with a cable needle. It's just that little knit two together and then slide one stitch off and knit through the back. Yeah, it's super simple cable twisted stitch, right twist is abbreviated. Um, this pattern will come out as an ebook in a set at a discounted price for the long term. And then you can also buy it as individual patterns. So when 
you go to purchase it, if you want to buy both of them together, buy it as an ebook. Don't put them both in your cart or it's going to be six, $6 and $6 or just $12, which I think is too much um, for buying two patterns that are essentially very similar, except for the decreases on the one and the two size, you know, the sizing. There's multiple sizes of this. Um, and it is knit in DK weight yarn and I used brown sheep again. I just find that their yarn is highly accessible in a multitude of colors and I like supporting a family business. So, um, this is the coordinating set. I had a lot of test knitters knit the hat. Um, so there are lots of colorways out there for you to look at on Ravelry. If you are um, interested in finding, you know, what colors looked great, I had some really fun bright colored ones and muted colored ones, so that was fun. I will say that I got a couple of um, emails in the last couple weeks regarding Brown Sheep's website and that people were having a little bit of difficulty using the website. So this is the Brown Sheep color catalog that is $6 on their website, so you can go and order it. And it has all the weights of yarn, I think I've showed this before, with all the colors that they carry in that yarn. So no matter what you're looking up, they have hundreds of colors. But I took some screenshots and so I'm going to tell you, when you go to the website, but I took some screenshots and when you go to the website, the first thing you need to click on at the top is shop, capital letters in the top bar. And then you need to negotiate on the left-hand side of the screen. So they have, if you're looking for certain colors, you click on a circle that is blue or red or purple or pink, and they have all their colors sorted by color families. And then all their colors are also named. So in reds, they'll have several different names, barn red, persimmon, cardinal, whatever, in their red category. And along that left-hand side, they also have a menu for the weight of yarn that you're looking for. So if you are really looking for worsted weight, DK weight, sport weight yarn, the, your first best bet is to click on the button that has sport or DK, and then the color that you might be looking for. Then the screen will fill with all those colors. It will also fill with any other yarns that they carry that is in that weight. So it might, if you're just looking for nature spun, you wanna click on nature spun, not just sport weight. So yes, I would agree that there is a bit of, you know, <laughs> you need a little bit of experience on the Brown Sheep website to kind of negotiate it well, because if you click on the drop down menu for color family, you click blue, then when you click on below, it will list all the colors of blue. Then when you choose the one you want, let's say butterfly blue, that picture will come up on the screen. But the first couple times people use it, I, I just have had some questions where people are like, I can't figure out what colors to use. And not everybody should have to buy the color catalog to figure out what colors they have. I don't know um, a better way. I don't think that they have a picture of all the colors on one page on their website. They just, if you wanted all the Nature Spun colors, they're all here. So it's these two pages and this page, all the Nature Spun colors and they don't have that featured somewhere that I know of. Now, I'm, I've reached out, I'll re be reaching out to Brown Sheep to try to figure out if there is somewhere where that is and that I just have never looked at looked for it. I just buy so much yarn for them that I've just gotten kind of used to knowing what their colors are and which colors that they want. So I just wanted to give you a heads up and a little bit of information since I do have this pattern um, coming out tomorrow and then in two weeks I have the last pattern of the entire fall series um, that will also be in their yarn in sport weight so I just wanted to put it out there about their their website in addition I contacted a yarn mill this week and they were out of white yarn and I was like hmm that's interesting because brown sheep has been out of white yarn. Their um, half and half colorway has been hard to find, hard to get. And then this Shepherd's Wool site out of Michigan said we, we, we're out of, and we can't make yarn in anything that takes white to make it because we don't have enough white. And I was like, oh, interesting. 
This is a pandemic issue. This is a, we shut down some mills and mills were not running for a while. And now lots of people are staying at home and buying yarn and knitting and more people are buying yarn and more people are knitting. And there's a supply and demand issue, which I was not aware of. So I'm also going to tell you that, that if you're out looking for yarns from some of these mills, I know we all know that the indie dyers had trouble getting plain yarn, right? They, they had trouble getting yarn. I know several indie dyers that were trying to order and it was back ordered and they couldn't get it in and mini skeins were hard to find. It's all part of the pandemic, which, you know, put two and two together. But I just hadn't until I called Shepherd's Wool this week looking for one more skein of gray yarn and she didn't have any. And she said, we need white to make that color. And she did find a, um, like a seconds, like a uh, what are they called? Mill end. She found a mill end in gray for me and I don't need too much to finish up this sweater that I'm knitting. And so, yeah, but I thought, gosh, I should pass that along too, right? That we're just all so used to being able to click. I mean, Amazon has made our lives so easy to click and ship and have it immediately that now when we have to wait a week to get something, we're irritable, right? So, and I know not everyone uses Amazon. I know that's a whole issue. I'm just, you know, in generally, I'm just speaking about like click and ship. You buy something and it comes within two days. And now we've had the, you know, Christmas, we had all these backups and people got so angry and frustrated and mad. And we all know that there, you know, there are millions and millions of packages going worldwide every day. I also want to say that Brown Sheep sells yarn by the cone. So if you are interested in fingering or sport weight, I think it is, um, yes, the cones, that you can get 1,682 yards of sport weight yarn on a cone and 2,800 of fingering weight yarn on a cone. So if you wanted to make a sweater, I think the cones ran about $46, something like that. You could for sure make a sweater out of that and have it all be connected and you wouldn't have ends and you know, to weave in if you were interested in that. I have a special note just to add here um, in this tips and tricks section that the Betweenity hat, cowl, and mitten set came out and it is an ebook available, but there was a kind of a highlight that I forgot to mention. In the pattern for this set, I included a color chart as well as a black and white chart. If you are knitting color work pattern and you print it out and you don't have a color printer or you, color's too expensive to print, which we all know is can be a huge issue, those color cartridges, if you print my pattern in black and white, you'll be okay. This won't show up very well, but this will. And this is the same chart, but we just have little letters in there. So main color is all in there. Contrast color is all in there. Contrast color one and two. So I just made a chart so that when you printed it out, if you got somewhere and you were like, oh, I didn't know that I had to have it in color, it doesn't show up, you would have an option. In a chart like this that's two color, then it's very easy because that is printing in black and white when I chart it. It's just black and white boxes. But when you had a chart that was multicolored on a pattern, you need to do the chart in black and white. And I have some new patterns that are gonna be coming out with lots of color in them in color work. And so my tech editor and I worked this system out for me because I had not had a all over color work pattern come out since up until this time. So the charts are, it looks like you have two charts, but they, if you colored this one in, it would look just like this one. So just wanted to give you a heads up on that. You know, we're always learning different ways to help people and figure stuff out so that you don't have to print that out and then mark it, color, color mark it. I know people do that all the time. Oh, right. I had a note from a person this week. There were some, two people, and probably three in the last year and a half that I've ever had have had trouble with my website um, and getting the newsletter. If you go to my website and you go to newsletter, subscribe, and you put in your first name and your, ad, in your email address and you hit send, you have to approve that. That's the law. There's a law around email collecting, subscribing, subscribers' email addresses. So you would get an email that would say, 
did you subscribe to this I'm not a robot one of those there are several prompts that you know you have to click on if you didn't click on it then you're you're not getting the email and I had someone who wasn't getting the email and I had someone whose email wouldn't go into the website box and I was like this is so strange let me try your email and then she would get the second command and it wouldn't work for her and um, so I had to learn some new things and one of the things that I have now figured out is that I don't have to contact my website developer to look at who the subscribers are and who who gets it and who opens it and who doesn't right at the time so that I can look up and say hey yes you got it and you opened it or well you've gotten it but you've never opened it so it's in your trash somewhere or it's in another folder somewhere it's in your spam that kind of thing I'm not spending time looking to see if you're opening my emails I do not have time for that right I have 12 14 other people on that list so far I'm not looking but this person said to me I know some email providers will automatically start sending emails to spam and junk if emails from a particular sender are deleted multiple times without being read. And if the recipient never checks their spam, they would probably assume that they just aren't getting those emails. Your customer may need to add your newsletter email to her whitelist if this happened. I don't know what that means exactly, but if you are never opening the emails that go to say your promotions folder on Gmail and you delete them constantly apparently there are some providers for email and I don't know if it's Gmail or not who will just say well you never want to see this again and they'll throw it to your spam which totally made sense to me right I when I had Earthlink before we had stuff in our spam folder all the time that wasn't spam and I think that's part of the the reason so I'm not the only one that has a newsletter subscriber page and I am only going to ever send you one when there's a coupon code and a discount and I don't ever expect anyone to always click through and always buy. I didn't know that I could go in there and look and, look and do it. I didn't know I could check out if someone's email was in there so if they're not getting it I can go look now and I can say oh yeah no I, you're not subscribed so subscribe again or whatever. Always learning all kinds of interesting things to figure out and and do but if you are not signed up for my newsletter and you did not get the coupon code <clears throat> for the, do the dog words hat and cowl then I have a new hat and cowl or, yeah I have a new hat and cowl coming out in two weeks so make sure you get on that subscriber list and then I have a two other patterns coming out two weeks after that <clears throat> I did have someone ask this week where they could buy the Knit What Words soft cover ebook, and it's only available on my website. Um, but you can go over there and look under soft cover. There's also the ebook um, that you can get on Ravelry and my website. Um, and the individual patterns are all on my website and Ravelry as well. But if you're looking for that soft cover book, some of you, because you have Minnesota 52, want to make sure that you have Knit Words. And I'm hopefully um, working on a proposal to do another one coming out sometime in the future <laughs> right so cool. many of you commented on my shoulder <laughs> scenario last week and it wasn't great news I went and saw my guy um, he replaced my knee and I really like him he, he's an older guy getting closer to retirement and he did some x-rays because I hadn't had them for many years. Um, he had injected my shoulder a number of times over the last five years, probably three times. The first couple times it lasted a couple years and then this time it had been like a year, a year and a half. And they took an x-ray and he came in shaking his head and he said, no more injections for you. Your shoulder is gone. You have no more shoulder. You have a big bone spur in there. It's no wonder you don't have good range of motion. And it's kind of square instead of round there's no uh, space in the joint he showed me the old one where I had like a little bit of space and then he said to me is in, someone in your family have arthritis <laughs> and my mom has significant arthritis and I think I've mentioned it on the podcast but she has like a degenerative fascia where like all the connective tissue just has kind of gone away and hers started probably 20 years before mine but I think you know hereditary I have some of that so um, mine I think she, mom's had 24 26 surgeries in the last I don't know 30 40 years 
I'd say. Um, and I see an orthopedic surgeon tomorrow. I will not have another surgery. Um, I can get by with my shoulder like this for a while. It, I just don't have good range of motion. I can't lift it up above here unless I use my hand to help with it. But I don't. I have, my left arm has great range of motion, so if I need to reach something down, this is the hand to use because the grip strength is back on this one anyway, and not so much on this one. But I was really dejected for about an hour. I sat in the parking lot. I called my mom, and then she felt bad, which I didn't mean to make her feel bad. But both my parents have had shoulder surgeries, and uh, so I should have known that there was, you know, going to be an issue with it. Um, it's fairly painful when I tweak it or if I just now like I tried to reach up incorrectly I, I'm a right side sleeper that's when I've noticed the biggest change since the hands started getting better and I could sleep without the brace at night I started trying to sleep on my right side which is what I prefer with my arm under my pillow and that was not working and that's what made me realize that oh yeah the shoulder I wasn't using this arm for so long so I know some of you will ask and so I just want to Heads up tomorrow, 220. I'll just see what he has to say. My my knee doctor um, has done shoulders, but he said, I'm gonna send you to my guy, the, the best guy in our practice for shoulders. He's only here one day a week, but um, I think you should see him and make sure you get a second opinion because I told him, you know, I've had three surgeries this year and I really, I, I can't have another one right now. And it was, it's only been two and a half years since my knee replacement, so. I am probably looking at this kind of scenario for the rest of my life where I have body parts that are going to break down and I'm going to just have to have um, kind of a buck up attitude about it. I still have things I want to do, exercise that I want to do, getting out and walking with my dog. My husband and I would like to travel, which usually involves a lot of walking, right? When you travel and you go to see things. So I need to be able to do it. And so I'll just have to accommodate those body parts as I can. I'm fine. It's just another glitch in the road for a body that was beat up and tormented for many years. Um, a lot of you liked my stories from last time about my gymnastics career and how I treated my body for all those years back in the day when the equipment was not great. Uh, so I, I will be fine. You know, you have to be thankful that it's fixable because many years ago, these things weren't fixable, not at all. So we'll see what he has to say. Ross can't go with me, but I will call him so he can listen in um, to what this doctor has to say. I have not had an MRI. I would think that that might be part of the next uh, bit of the process. But like I said, like right now I'm petting the dog and I can use it just fine down here. And I can knit with it. If I had to knit over my head, I'd be another story. I'd be signing me up. Okay, the Corey Stories this week is a story that I'm going to tell from May's voice. Um, my mother-in-law May has been feeling under the weather still. It's been a, a week or two where she's had to have um, some extra oxygen and sleeping a lot and feeling under the weather. Um, so that we call a lot. I, I check in with her quite a bit, but Several months ago, when I was talking to her on the phone and we were chatting, she was telling me about her summer job in 1948, and I started taking notes. The reason that I started taking notes is that May's summer job was as a first floor servant uh, maid on Park Avenue in Minneapolis, which is where the wealthy lived. There are 33 mansions along Park Avenue, in the older part of the city and she lived at 2424 Park Avenue. My daughter Kylie's college roommate Macy moved to the Twin Cities after graduation and is working in downtown Minneapolis and she is living at 2525 Park Avenue on the third floor of an old mansion. And I couldn't remember May's address or Macy's address in the moment but I knew that they were close together and that it could be the same place so I did a deep dive this is the house now that May lived in all those years ago it had kind of a turret of course now it has permanent siding so it didn't look like that and has a big front porch 
And then I will, maybe I'll just put the picture in. And then this is the house that Macy lives in. And uh, they are just blocks apart from one another on this Park Avenue. This older, not the best part of Minneapolis anymore like it has not been kept up like some other areas of the city there are nice homes there a lot of them have been turned into rental apartments rental houses rental buildings and but it's very near a big hospital system that we have so May's house that she lived in for that summer has been torn down and it there is a small three-story office type building that's kind of part of that hospital campus on that lot as far as I can tell from Google Maps. I have not driven down there, but I will. But I wanted to tell Kylie and Macy this story. So as May was telling it to me, I was jotting down notes. And these are the notes that I had. In 1948, she was a first floor maid at 2424 Park Avenue for her summer job. She made $25 a week and free room and board. The family that she worked for, the Douglas family, owned the land that the downtown Dayton's building was built on. He was a lawyer and a real estate investor. And Dayton's in Minnesota is the big department store, like similar to a Macy's or, a, you know, what it like Von Maurer back in the day. Dayton's was the place everyone shopped and there was a big Macy's, uh, or I mean Dayton's, building in the center of downtown Minneapolis, department store, they have, you know, multiple floors with all kinds of products, um, and he owned that land. So there were eight workers, including a gardener, a chauffeur, and the maids, and there were eight bathrooms in the home, a bowling alley, a walk-in cooler, and a huge library. May was given a scolding at one point for giving cold water to the to an african-american mailman not because she couldn't but because it was extremely hot and she served him at the front door out of the good pitcher she said should have given anyone who came to the door water not from the family pitcher but at the back door um and that would have been you know kind of a part of the era right where she but she said she told me that story that she got scolded Mrs. George P. Douglas was the wife and May's employer, and she would have been 78 years old when May worked there. May was 19. George, her husband, was ill and had a full-time nurse to care for him, and May never met him the entire summer that she was there. So then I looked up Bessie Pettit Douglas, and she was a former debutante, and she was quoted in several historical society articles on dressmaking and the dresses of the era because she would have been someone who would have had many dresses made and would have had a lot of social engagements and activities when she was young. And so there's a picture of her at age 18 from 1888. And it, it her quote for once says, if one bought a model dress before it had been copied, the price was high, but one could be sure that there would be, not be another dress like it in the city. And that was from an 1880 to 1920 article. Another quote she had is, the wedding gown is made of the most beautiful satin I ever saw. Mademoiselle Boyd said it is the finest ever. And that was, um, she was a bridesmaid in a wedding. And then another dressmaker article said, she sewed dressers for some of the city's leading women, including Bessie Pettit Douglas. And then there was a picture of a dress that I assume Bessie had, but I'm not sure that maybe she had donated it to the Historical Society. So the Douglas family is buried um, at Lakewood Cemetery, which is in the center of Minneapolis, a very old and prestigious cemetery. They have a plot of land with a big headstone. And she was born in 1870 and she died in 1955 at the age of 84. And then I have the plot and the memorial ID. So if we decide to go to Lake Lakewood Cemetery, we could look that up and where, <coughs> where that's located. And then I also found the street view on Google Maps. So I, I, I included that for the girls to see. And then there was a picture of George Douglas. Because he was a lawyer, there were alumni journals. So I found out a lot more information about him. 
George Perkins Douglas antecedents was born in Stowe, Vermont in 1865. His father was a merchant. He, his early life, he was prepared for college in private schools. He was for some time a member of the class of 88, which is interesting because he graduated in 89, so I don't know what happened there. Um, I don't know if he took a year off and traveled or whatever. He had college honors. He, after his career, he studied law and was admitted to practice in Minnesota. He is still practicing law, although he is now serving as secretary to the mayor of Minneapolis and is manager of the police department of that city of September 1st, 1893. He had the misfortune to shoot off his left arm, which, accident, which the accident left interfered for some time with his professional work. Well, I can't even imagine in 1893 shooting off your left arm and the, the likelihood that you would survive that kind of a wound, which I don't know if had to do with why he was sick in the later part of his life when May was um, living there. She did not know that about him, so that was very interesting. They had two daughters, um, Deborah Louise and Elizabeth Pettit, um, but May um, said that the daughters... Um, would come to visit and were not very nice to the maids and would often drink too much, have too much to drink, and then be a little rowdy and belligerent when they came to visit. And then here's the write-up of history from Minneapolis and Hennepin County. Prominent in professional life as a capable, energetic, resourceful, and successful lawyer, and during the last 12 or 13 years, standing high as a real estate investor, George P. Douglas of Minneapolis has fully satisfied the confidence the community has in him. Mr. Douglas exemplifies in his energy and ingenuity the salient characteristics of the section of country and race of people from which he came. Really? That's how they wrote? He was born in Vermont in 1866 and is a typical New Englander, Englander in every commendable feature. He is a son of Christopher F. and Louisa Perkins Douglas, with whom he came to Minneapolis in 1873 when he was seven years old. The father of a dry goods merchant in the firm of Camp Douglas and Gold and also operated a flour mill on Minnehaha Creek, which if you're from Minnesota, that is very well known area, Minnehaha Creek area. He was active in enterprising business until about 1885 when he retired. He died in 1910, age 79, having survived his wife by a number of years. So that was his father. Their son, George P. Douglas, was prepared for college at the Eastside Academy in Minneapolis, and in 1885 entered Yale at University from the academic depart of which he was graduated in 1889. So he was there for four years, and currently a law degree is three years, so I don't know if that's when that gap happened. He then became a student in the law department of the University of Minnesota, obtaining his degree of LLB in 1890. So he seems like he transferred to, from Yale to the U of M. During the next 10 years, he practiced his profession, but more promising fields of endeavor opened before him and he entered without hesitation and has cultivated them with great enterprise and success for himself and with decided advantage to the community. I mean, this, the writing is just so uh, flowery and interesting. The new fields were in the real estate business and in this, Dr. Douglas has been engaged with profit and a steadily rising and widening reputation ever since. In a measure, he gave it precedence over the law. He was mastered his own business in his line and made himself well informed with reference to it. That he has become an authority on every phase of it and his opinion and judgment have great weight in connection with everything belonging to it. <laughs> so anyway, there are three more paragraphs. In his political relations, he was an ardent Democrat and a very hard, faithful and efficient worker for his party. He has served for some years as chairman of its local campaign committee. Um, the, mom, the mother is a member of Westminster Presbyterian Church. She and her husband are very fond of the enjoyment of social life, so furnished by a select circle of congenial friends. And their home at 24, 24 Park Avenue is an attractive and much frequented resort for such circles. So, I mean, very hoity-toity, this family that she worked for. Her parents sent her down from rural Minnesota. She was going to go to school to become a teacher. She got a um, all-grades-inclusive teaching degree, um, but this would have been the summer um, before, probably, when she was 19, or she maybe had a summer break from college. So, I found out, you know, quite a bit of information. I am no genealogical researcher, 
but I sent this packet of information to Kylie and Macy and May and she's been reading it and sharing it with the nurses. Um, I just thought I would share with all of you because I'd done the work to kind of find out some back history and information about that family and all of you know that I have a love of May and um, so I just wanted her to have something. She's been on lockdown since March, you know, had COVID <laughs> and not been feeling well. So I thought it, you know, might lift her spirits. Anyway, that's your Corey stories for today. I'm back hours later <laughs> to edit this in because I forgot to talk about it on the podcast this afternoon, but I knit a swatch for the plaid blanket and I wove in some yarn and I used the same yarn that I had originally used in the plaid blanket and then I threw this in the washer and the dryer to just see what we would get if we gentle or delicate washed this and lightly dried it just a little bit and then laid it out. So it was damp when I took it out and it did felt slightly. This was not um, wetted and blocked when I did it because I just needed to get it done yesterday. But I would say it held up just fine, slightly felted, still has some give down there. And if the knots weren't tied, this would still have, you know, quite a give, bit of give, but I will hold it up closely here. It looks pretty good. The fringe, however, did not hold up well. These I were, was cutting short and then it dawned on me that they might be in perspective to the actual swatch, but that the long pieces on the blanket would be much longer. And they just got kind of, oh, stringy. They, they felt it a little and they got kind of stringy. Now, I think if I cut these off evenly, they would probably look okay. So if you had to, were forced to wash your pump up the plaid, brown sheep yarn, you know, held double, you could get away with it, especially if you didn't put it in the dryer. I just wanted to kind of see what, what I would get out of that. The plaid held up fine. Uh, this is not a big piece, so it's not exactly, you know, if you're doing an experiment, you would throw the whole, but I don't have the blankets right now. They're at a yarn shop on display. So uh, this is just the best that I had to try it. But I wanted to give people the heads up that I had said on the last podcast, I would see what I could come up with. So here you go. Let's do the hellos and wrap this up. The hellos for episode 66 are Brandy Stoker, who liked my dancing at the beginning of the <laughs> podcast, which is ironic because I was just sitting here. I almost edited that out. Edie Swartz, Pat House, hi to Joy Yusuf Zi. Yusuf, Yusuf Zi. I'm getting it, getting really close. Mary Shu, Callie Mathern, Robin Glasser, Michelle M, Joanne Goldenberg, Luana Hendricks, Irene Whaler, Melanie Cahoon, Danielle Brown, Rachel Dobson, Angela Jenkins, who liked the um, the betweenity pattern last week and that Heidi was the model, so yes, she was. The model for the um, new set is um, Heidi's cousin, Hannah. Um, Susie Parks, Kathy Brattell, Suzanne Selby, Terry Monk, Mary Case, Margarita Deverson, Jill Jackson, Linda Bauman, Lisa Smith, Butterfly Crochet and Knit, Peggy Bork, Deb Vandermolen, Kathy B, Olivia Menke, um, who commented on different needle sizes. In regards to uh, changing it up so your hands don't get quite so fatigued by using the bigger needles, which sometimes can cramp people's hands. Remember the, that little chat we have? Um, and also um, Bonnie Vandemark, who agreed with my concept, who is a physical therapist, um, about using different needle sizes um, and kind of rotating and not doing fingering weight all the time. Some of you shawls and socks. You got to do some stuff that changes it up a little bit, right? Uh, Victoria Knits um, got a letter back from May and so she let me know because May has written a couple letters back to people. Um, I know her handwriting is really hard to read. She's getting quite shaky, um, but I appreciated knowing that. Uh, Janet Robertson, Marnie Haluska, Li Liza Kingston Coleman, Rochelle in Seattle, Joe Felker, who is newer to the podcast. She just found me recently. So hi, Joe, and welcome. Evelyn Burt, Connie Simonich, Susie Fab, Jenny Davis, 
who liked my comments about teachers last time I did I do have great regard for teachers all of the ones that came before me and who taught me Rachel Weisenstein agreed who is teacher hi Rachel <laughs> Denise Norber Teresa sleeper who got a hall tree like mine um, several of you commented that you have hall trees or coat racks or hat racks or project bag racks right Shady Sue uh, Kathy Adkins who liked the love letters cowl and said it was perfect for some mini skeins she wanted to use um, Karen Mezzacapo Glenda Bathgate Beth Arner crochet creations by Christy Suzanne Gates Julie Smith Kristen Peterson Kat Montgomery Cheryl Lacemaker Peggy McFeeders who uses old purses as project bags which I think is a great idea if you have some old purses and you wanted to buy a tree a bag tree and you don't have a lot of project bags hang them in some old purses that you might have uh, Cheryl Clute and Lisa Smith who commented that they both had shoulder replacements and that it's not fun <laughs> so thanks for that I think um, Judith Musgraw Catri Catriona Alsop Diana Barnes who said that they were out of white yarn several of you found that brown sheep was out of white yarn and they they are shipping it now I know someone commented that they got their back ordered yarn from brown sheep <clears throat> hi to Bonnie glass Emily South Pursuth, um, who said that she's the one that adds baking soda to cut the acidity of tomato sauce when you're making your tomato sauce so that was really good to know I have that written on a uh, recipe of mine that baking soda can cut some of that acidity uh, mystery glow Judy Jesse's mom 12 Debbie McKenzie Emma butcher Heather Wilson Colette Freeman Jeanette Legro Legri Aldi how'd I do Kathy Evans Christine Carr Lisa Blues Pamela Collier Candy Harris Tensi Marcos Bodker Eileen Tomero Georgia Sherry Palmer Georgia or Georgian Braden who is asking me uh, about which episode I talked about fixing the neck opening on a sweater and I looked that up for it was the one where I was with Amber at Virginia Beach so it's pretty easy to find when you scroll because there's the two of us on the screen but I will do a video on that and post it to YouTube and then you know if I get this camera setup thing working and I'm gonna take out one of my sweaters where the neckline was too big and I ran that string around so thanks for kind of prompting me on that Georgian um, I will get that up in the next you know few weeks as I can okay so hello to everyone thanks for commenting I had like 178 comments this week as we went back and forth when I went to look and I was like wow we have good interaction <laughs> in this group it just it makes my day to read your comments and uh, kind of get to know some of you and where you live and what you're knitting that kind of thing so that's really fun for me <sighs> that's all for this week from me thank you so much for watching Please subscribe and give me a thumbs up if you can. Waddle on, no green bananas. Keep it colorful. Keep your fork. You'll never regret ripping back and playing with your mouth full. I love you all. Bye.